Good morning. Good morning. Um, welcome to First Baptist Birmingham today. Um, we are glad to have you here on this special youth-led service. Um, if you're a visitor, could you please sign a card and put it in the offering plate later in the service? Um, in the bulletin, you'll see that we have some announcements. On March 7th, uh, Colonel John Grimes will be speaking at the WMU General Meeting in the Fellowship Hall at 11. Um, also, Joe Marchetti, Joe Marchetti is having a is having a senior recital at Boating Studio on Sanford campus uh, on Thursday, March 9th at 6 p.m. Also, on March 11th, the youth is having a yard sale at the church. Money raised from this will go to help fund the youth choir tour to Cincinnati this year. The youth will also be going to Daphne on March 18th and the 19th to hang out with the youth choir from Eastern Shore who will be going with us on choir tour this year. Finally, the FBC seniors will continue discovering the Magic City on March 16th. Our clerk is going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and this time we get to worship together. Thank you for your Holy Spirit being among us, Lord. I pray that we use this time of worship to your glory and your honor. I pray for Nathan today as he delivers your message and also that we respond to the Spirit's leading today. In your name we pray. Psalms 98 4. Shout, jo shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Thank you. 
Welcome to First Baptist. Our youth is so excited this morning for the opportunity to help lead in the service. Visitors, fill it, please fill out the card in front of you to help us get to know you better. Now will you join us in greeting each other in a time of fellowship. Please be seated. Listen as I read from Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Peter 2, 24. For himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By his stripes you were healed. Thanks, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift.
Psalm 96, verses 7 through 8 says, Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Joseph Hopkins will now lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that we are free to worship you today in this place. Thank you for giving us a church family that supports our youth group. Continue to bless our efforts today as we lead in worship. Our goal is that it would be pleasing to you. It is our privilege to give back because you have done so much for us. Please bless these offerings and those who give them. In your name we pray. Amen.
Javion is a wonderful young man that you need to get to know if you haven't already. Over Christmas, we had a Christmas party with the youth, and he asked if he could share his testimony. I said, well, well yeah, sure. And then I was like, wow, that was amazing. And so I asked, and he was more than willing to share that with you this morning. So Javion Love. My name is Javion Snow, and I'd like to share my testimony with y'all. So when I, grew, when I was growing up in my early ages, I was... We lived in Tarrant, Alabama, and it was pretty rough. Saw some things that I didn't really need to see and heard some things that I didn't need to hear. And seeing things go in front of me, like people getting arrested, like my family. And so my godmother didn't want that life for me, and she, didn't, she knew that that wasn't what God had planned for me, and she didn't want me to go down a bad road. So... We moved to Homewood, and I lived with my grandmother because um, my mother and uh, my cousin's mother and everyone else, they couldn't really take care of me. They just couldn't. And so I lived with my grandmother in Homewood. And so um, she was a big church lady, and I loved my grandmother so much. I wanted the best. I wanted to do my best for her. And so she wanted us to go to church and the church was right in our backyard and so we started going to church and I knew a lot of people there because they went to my school at that time and so it was pretty fun. I kept going there for a while and so later on there was this youth trip that we took and so we went on it and I remember the preacher saying that you need Jesus in your life like, or you really, there's really no point, there's no goal for anything. Like, you can't do anything without them. And um, to share the gospel with other people. And so I felt like I didn't have that, but I wanted to have it. And so I gave my life to Christ then. And I felt like my life was changed and my grandmother was proud of me and I wanted her to be proud of me. And so we kept living in home where we thought that was the best place to live. And so my grandmother, besides basketball, that was the only sport I was really playing. And so she decided that we should do something new. And so I started playing baseball and I really didn't know how to play. It was kind of weird. Didn't know anybody there. And the coaches really had to teach me one step by step and stuff. And so I played my first year, wasn't that great. And the second year, um, my grandmother was really trying to meet friends and she met the Snow family here at the church. And I felt like that was a blessing that I got to keep going with them and staying with them for a little bit and hanging out with them. And um, a few years later, my grandmother, she got diagnosed with cancer and um, it was kind of stressful for me because I had to do a lot more work around the house and be more responsible. And so my grades were going down and I really needed help. And so I started to go over to the Snow's house a lot more and they helped me with that. And so my grandmother said, well, she knew that she wasn't gonna, she didn't have a, like a year left in her. And she told me that there's nothing good in this world. So just keep believing in Christ and trying your best and give your, share your testimony with other people and um, your life will be changed. And I really stuck with that because I didn't want to disappoint her.
think the youth have done a great job this morning. Um, when Dr. Cooley and Dr. Hopkins asked at the beginning of the year if the youth would be willing to lead, we said, sure, but uh, give us some time to get ready and prepare. So since January 18th, we've been studying worship and what makes the service and the worship service, uh, puts that, what puts that together. We've been studying that for the last, I guess, a uh, month and a half. Um, and I want you to know as a church family, uh, this was approached reverently and very seriously. Um, it was, um, not only did the, did the youth prepare what you saw them do this morning, but they also prepared themselves spiritually. And um, they each signed a card of commitment back in January, getting ready um, for this day. And I asked Vance um, and George if they wouldn't mind reading that to y'all so y'all can hear um, the commitment that the youth signed um, back in January. So Vance and George. I commit to do my best to prepare for the Youth Lead Sunday service on March 5th. I realize it's an honor and privilege to be asked to lead in worship. I also, I also realize that this comes with great responsibility. I pledge to do my best in whatever aspect of the service I am involved. Furthermore, I pledge to prepare myself spiritually to lead others in worshiping God. This means I will set aside time each week to confess sin, to pray, to read God's word, and to seek his will for my life. I will not take this responsibility lightly, and I commit to giving this service the seriousness it deserves. Thank you. And I think they've been true to what they committed back in January. Um, preparing for this Sunday, we had a passage of scripture, which we'll read in, in, a, in a moment, Psalm 96, verses 1 through 9. You've heard some of that this morning, but... That passage covers many of the acts of service that we see each week here at our church um, and many churches across the nation. And so this, this passage was our home base, so to speak, um, where we got a lot of our education about worship from. So um, I'd like to read that together, um, or I will, um, and together we'll join. Um, that's tricky. Um, so, um, but before we read it, I would like to look at three things that the psalmist says to give, and we'll read that in a second, but he says, the psalmist instructs us to give to the Lord, um, O families of the people, give to the Lord glory and strength, and then to give to the Lord the glory due his name, and, and we'll see that um, in a moment. So let's read um, Psalm 96, one through nine. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim the good news, of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the people. And the reasons we do that here in verse four, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory and do his name, bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And this morning we're gonna take a moment to look at verses seven and verses eight. But before we do that, let, let us pray as we dive in this morning. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity to lead worship. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to bring your word through song, through scripture, through prayer, and, and through the preaching of your word. I pray that you will speak uh, your truth to us this morning. In your name I pray, amen. So before we individually look at these three commands to give, I think it would be helpful to understand why we give and where that comes from. So does God need anything from us? So if he, if he doesn't, then why is it here in Scripture? And if he does, then why or what <clears throat> are we giving to him? We learned that giving is an act of worship. Um, it could be giving praise through song, which we've done, and, or it could be giving through um, a tithe or an offering. But giving is an act of worship, and because they're acts of worship, we should look at worship to help us understand what giving means for us. So worship, it comes from the old English word meaning worth-ship, um, giving worth to God. Um, but because of sin, what do we tend to do? We give worth and we worship other things, right? Maybe um, 
an object, maybe a relationship, maybe a promotion or a, or a job or a hobby. Uh, we worship that instead of God. And what's that called? Idol- yeah, idolatry or idols. Um, so t- Christian writer Tim Keller does a wonderful job of saying worship is pulling our affections off of our idols and putting them on God. Worship is seeing what God is worth and giving him what he's worth. There's a picture up on the screen um, of a lady, a 72-year-old lady in um, California. Her name is Bernice Gallego. Um, She had a baseball card, which you see in her basement, and she was going to sell it for $10 to someone, but a a friend intervened and said, why don't you hold on to that? You may not want to sell that for $10. Long story short, it ended up selling for $75,285 on the auction block. It was some rare first professional baseball team um, card or something. So I ask you, did, did the worth of the card change over time? Or when she had it, did that worth change? Or did the worth she gave it change? So it was worth that all along, but the worth she gave it so at one point it was worth 10 bucks, and at another point she was like, oh wow, it's worth 75,000. That's pretty good. Um, isn't that the same with the Lord and our relationship with Him? It, has there been a time when the Lord was worth $10 to you? That's all you cared about the Lord. Um, you didn't put much into your relationship, you didn't invest any time with Him. But then was there a time like that card when Jesus became worth $75,000, so to speak, when He became worth everything to you? Um, God never changed. He was there. He was the same the whole time. But the worth that you gave him changed, which brings us back to Psalm 96. In verses 7 and 8, we are instructed to give. And why do we give in review? Because we are worshiping or giving worth to God. Not because God needs anything, but because we give back to him what we've received and what we've realized he is worth to us. And we do that cheerfully, right? God loves a cheerful giver. Okay, so... Let's, let's look at these three things. Three things we should give or three ways to give worth to God. The first is in verse 7. It says, give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Your, your Bible might say kindreds of peoples or families of nations, but give to the Lord. So the psalmist could have just easily said, give to the Lord peoples, right? So why did he put families? Give to the Lord, O families. Well, the family, as you know, is, a, is an ordination of God. Um, it's, it's ordained by God and plays an important part in worship. From the beginning in Genesis, we've seen um, Genesis 128, be fruitful and multiply. The, the doctrine and the ordination of the family it was seen there. And then um, the, the, the example of family worship is seen in the Israelites' journey in the wilderness. Deuteronomy, Joshua, there's many verses there that give example to that. But Moses reminds them in Deuteronomy 31 verses 12 and 13, he says, gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live. And we follow that biblical example here in our church as you can look around and see all ages from from babies to Big, big babies. Um, so, um, sh- should have wrote that one out. Family worship. So, <laughs> family worship is vital in God's plan for us, and I love that our church takes that seriously um, here. And I think it strengthens families, but also nurtures the congregation in ways that um, not possible without the. Multi- so, so where would we be if the youth went off and had their own worship? We'd be missing out on this, and we'd be missing out on all ages. Um, if we didn't take that seriously here. Um, but, so, the family, give to the, fam- um, give to the Lord of families. It's, it's an ordination, we understand that. But what else? There's something a little bit more. Um, I took piano, um, as many of you know, I play the piano, and when I was 10 years old, I started taking lessons. Every Tuesday, I remember, I would go to this lady's house and I'd have a lesson, and what had to happen during the week for that lesson to be successful? Yeah, I had to practice, well, um, I had to practice, which I sometimes did. And <laughs> so for that lesson to be successful, I had to practice, but we had to keep a practice record that said she wanted me at some point to do 30 minutes a day of practice, and I would always have 30 minutes a day for seven days a week, or four or five, but, um, and I, 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 would, I would show up and say, boom, there you go. She went, did you really practice 30 minutes, or did you goof off for 20 
play around, and then really practice for 10. And that was usually the case, but she knew when I had practiced the full 30 minutes, and when I, so she knew. But verse 13 says in Deuteronomy that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord their God. I don't think we're going to learn that fear of God with our families as effectively one day a week. And I'm talking about Sunday mornings. Um, like my piano lessons, families won't be living to their full spiritual potential if the only family worship that takes place is on Sunday mornings here at church. Um, and, and who do you have the most influence over? Those that are around you the most and that know you the best, right? So the family. And isn't it funny because of that how Satan seems to love to attack the doctrine of the family? That's a side note. If you have a family, that's your calling. Um, that should come before work. That should come before hobbies. That should even come before church, and that's not an excuse, Dr. Cooley, to miss church, but that's an, that just shows how important the family is and what priority it should take. The youth, the youth guy, the senior pastor, the children's director, that can't take place, can't take the place of what God has called your family to be. Um, so in Psalm 96, the first thing we see is to give God, um, give to the Lord, O families. You need family worship, it's important, but beyond that, you need family worship not limited to Sunday or Wednesday, family worship that takes place seven days a week in God's wonderful design of the family. Let's keep reading. Um, Give to the Lord glory and strength, the second part of verse 7. We know this, but who alone is glorious and who alone is strong? The Lord. So another question. If God alone is strong, he doesn't need our strength, right? So, So what are we giving to God in this verse? Your Bible, some might say a scribe. And and it's not a literal giving. We're not literally giving strength to God, but we're putting glory and strength on God. I read something this week that said, we find his strength to be wonderful. This wonder is a giving kind of wonder in that we are especially glad that the greatness of the strength is his and not ours. He is infinitely strong and not us. Doesn't getting strength and kind of giving your strength and your source of strength from God, doesn't that kind of go against sometimes what our the world around us is doing. Like, the mentality I see is you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's up to you um, to, to, do your, um, to, to, um, to live your life. But that, that puts the emphasis back on us, right? And Psalm here is saying, well, that source of strength is from God. I did an internet search of this, the top self-help books. I, t- I typed in top self-help books of, I guess, all time. But um, it's interesting. One, you can heal your own life. Rewire your brain. Think yourself to a better life. I wonder how that's going. Be your own life coach. 10 ideas for self-improvement. How to save your own life. I'm sure these books are helpful in some ways, but um, for Christians, this ideology won't do that it's up to me to do, to do good. The strength I get is for me. No, it's from God. Um, I asked someone this morning, I said, imagine you're five years old, it's five o'clock on a Friday. You're on 280. You got to cross at the busiest section of 280. You got to cross from one side to the other. You're five years old, and your dad's there. He says, "Take my hand, son. Trust me. Let's go." I said, "What well, do you trust?" Yeah, sure. Okay. Fast forward 15 years. You're 20 years old. The exact same situation. You're 20 years old. Five o'clock on a Friday. 280. You got to cross it, and your dad says, "Take my hand, son. Let's go." And he's like, "No way." <laughs> So, what changed? He was your father at five, and he was your father at 20, right? What changed? Yeah, you're like, no, I'm good now. Um, I know better than you. You changed. So, isn't that how we treat God sometimes? Um, Maybe you start out, young married couple, you're working your way through grad school, bills are not, uh, barely getting paid, um, or maybe you had a difficult time in your family for a number of years, and during that time, um, all you could do was rely on God, and all you could do was get your daily strength from Him, your source of strength. Um, but then what happens? You graduate, you get a new job, that nice paycheck comes in, your bills are more than paid for, you get a house, move out of the apartment. Isn't it tempting then? To say, look what I've done for my family. I've done this. I've worked hard. I've, I've, I've spent many hours and uh, minutes getting this life for them. Isn't that the temptation? Isn't that there? The temptation to say, oh, my own strength. That's where I got that from. 
You say, God, you brought me this far. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm good to go from here. What does James say? James 1, 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And I believe we're in a dangerous place as Christians if when we evaluate our lives, we recognize that the source of strength is coming from something other than God. Um, So where are you ascribing or giving your strength this morning? Um, Let's keep reading. Almost done. Verse 8. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. I think the first thing to realize is giving God the glory due his name is a debt. What's the most important thing about a debt? Yeah, you got to repay it. Lindsay and I are in the process of buying a home in the process. And contrary to what you're thinking, we're not paying cash for it. And so <laughs> we, <laughs> we got to... Um, we got to borrow money from some lender, some mortgage company, right? What happens if we don't pay that mortgage? Yeah, they get the house. Bye-bye. Um, so, actually, if that happens, I'll come ask for more money, right, Dr. Cooley? Yeah? That wasn't in the notes. Got to stick to the notes. But <laughs> back on topic. So if we don't pay, they take the house. But we have the opportunity if we're faithful over however many years the loan is, if we're faithful every month to pay that back, we repay that debt, right? So is that the same with God? One part's the same as in that we owe a debt. We, um, the, the big difference with God is you can't repay that debt. Nothing in you and your own strength um, can repay that. But it says, give God the glory due his name. A God that is holy, just, true, whose name is power, all these things, but we can never fully repay him. So where does that put us? We'll come back to that. The command to give God the glory, do his name, is a call to live our lives holy, just, Christ-honoring, and Christ-like before him. And how are we doing on that right now, today? 1 Peter uh, Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Because it is written... Be holy, for I am holy. Is the weight of what that means something we even think about or realize if we call ourselves Christians? Do we realize what it means to live a holy life? Living a holy life means it's set apart for God. That means your whole life is set apart for God. It's his. It's not yours. It's not mine. Everything we do should be to give him our best. Joe Marchetti has a senior recital on March 9th. I'll be there. Hope you're there. Um, Six o'clock in Boulding Studio at Stanford. Interesting thing about some of his music is um, one or two of the pieces were written by his instructor. So the guy that teaches him guitar wrote a couple of the pieces that he's doing on his recital. And I asked him, I said, how does that make you feel? And he said, well, nervous and scared at first um, because, wow, I got to do my best. I got to do justice to this piece. Um, So he gives his best. So if Joe can do his best for his music, can't we do the best for the creator and composer of the, of the universe? I asked earlier, I said, where does the fact that we owe a debt we can't pay put us? Well, this is where it puts us. The least we can do as Christians is give everything we are to God. That's where it should start. Um, we give our families, we give our life, we give our finances, everything we are. You don't start with a little bit. If you're holy and set apart to God, it's, it's all his. Um, it's all or nothing. There's a video called Wrong Worship, and it takes some of the Christian songs and changes some of the words to make it funny, but also have a message. Um, one of the songs is I Surrender All. Well, they changed the words to I Surrender Some. And it's funny, but it's also a sad reality that uh, me as a Christian, you, we, don't we sometimes section off parts of our lives? Um, this is mine. This is God's. I give this time. I give my offering. I give my resource to him. Um, I do a lot, so I need my own time. I won't venture any guesses into what those areas might be, but, but you know the parts of your life that aren't holy and set apart for God, the ones that you're keeping for yourself. I know the ones in my life um, as well. I mentioned earlier that our families can't live up to the spiritual potential that God has for us if the only worship that, family worship that takes place is on Sunday morning. I think it's the same for us here and in the pews Um, we can't live up to the spiritual potential God wants for us and has for our lives if the only God we encounter is on 10, 15 on Sunday morning. Um, 
Javion did a great job of showing us that God designed us for more. There's nothing good in this world. And Javion challenged us to live a life set apart for Christ. So thank you for that. Our whole being, not some, all of it, it's his. So it's March 5th. We're in Homewood. It's 2017. How, what does that mean for us this morning? Let's do a quick review. 96.7, it says, Give to the Lord, O families of people. Ordination of the family is important. But beyond that, God designed families to be a place where um, spiritual maturity, growth, and nurturing takes place. So worship with your family 24-7. Um, uh, second part of that verse, give to the Lord glory and strength. Recognize that everything in this life is from good in this life, as Javion said, is from God. And he should be the source of our strength. What feeble attempt that we can do, what can that compare to God's strength? Um, give to the Lord the glory, do his name. It means we owe God a debt that we can never repay. To give him the glory means we live our lives and everything we are for him. Um, so t- today I challenge us to think about what that means. Maybe you're here and you have a family and you say, I would love for my family to take seriously this, this challenge to give to the Lord. I would love to make my family a place where um, spiritual growth takes place outside of Sunday, outside of Wednesday. Or maybe you say, I've been getting my strength from myself. I realize, I, I realize I've been giving myself way too much credit. I'm giving myself uh, the source of my strength is coming from what I'm trying to do, my own bootstraps mentality. Maybe I should give my, let the source of my strength come from God. Or maybe you say, I'm a Christian, but I need to live a little bit holier. I need to live a, my life set apart. I'm not really taking that part that seriously. Um, the worthless distractions and, and meaningless, um, and the things with um, no eternal significance are taking priority in my life. Maybe there's a fourth, a fourth person Maybe you're on the outside looking in. Maybe, maybe you say, I would love to lead my family um, in a Christ-like way. I would love to get my strength from God. I would love to be holy. I would love to be set apart for God. I would love to let him be the Lord of my life. But you, you can't do that yet because you haven't taken care of the first step, which is to give your life and everything you are to Christ. The very beginning we learned worship was realizing what God's worth and giving him what he's worth. What better way to end a worship service than to give your life as an act of worship and everything you are to the one and only just and forgiving God? This is a worship service. Worship is responding to what God has done. As we stand and sing, Lord, I need you, respond to what God is calling you to do in your life this morning.
not only grow And the best looking group we find in the city. <laughs> and we are so proud of our young people, so proud of what God is doing through the youth that we are so proud of what God is doing at Church. This is a special time. When the service is over and when our young people have led us in our Bible song, you find some of these kids and you let them know that you love them. And you find that they can have you tell them that if that day comes and you can't make them your house, <laughs> I'll make you look for somebody to help. <laughs> couple of folks that I want to recognize in a special way before we're done. Uh, this morning, one of the doctors is going to be leaving us early in the morning, right? We've gone for a couple of weeks to a concert tour in India. So we want to break for Joe this evening. Nathan Mack will step into different shoes. Aren't you going to be leaving so next week? And he and Joe, we're going to have a great night. Remember, this is old Joe Thursday night. That's going to be a great night. I'm looking forward. You got hurt, did you? Those of you who went to Nathan's uh, recital last year, remember how amazed you were at some of the things that this young man could do. You're going to feel the same way about this young man when you hear him play some of the the technical stuff that he can play. It is just beautiful. And then I just want to ask you this question. Did you notice that things seemed a little sunnier around church today? Did you notice there just seemed to be a smile hovering over the church? That's because this Sunday, for the first time in a while, Tim Foster is back. And I am so glad to have Tim back in church today. Tim, we have missed your smile, friend. We are so glad to have you back again. It's been a great day in God's house. Remember tonight, we're going to have a great time as we journey together. If you've not been a part of Journey, you come tonight at 5. We're going to have a great time as we worship together. Let's bow together and let's pray. And then after we pray, our young people are going to lead us in one final song. Father, we do pray that you bless us this day. Thank you for speaking to us through our young people, Lord, through testimony as Javion gave it to us, through our young people who read scripture, who've led prayers, who led us in worship, Father, who planned this service, who prepared, them, uh, prepared themselves. Father, we thank you for Nathan and the message that you gave us through your word. And Father, we pray because we leave this place knowing, Lord, we have worshiped in a very, very special way. Father, we pray that you help us to listen to what Nathan said to us today and to give you, Lord, everything that you deserve in all of our lives. We pray, Lord, that you bless us as we leave from this place to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.